very excited about tonight's conversation. I want to say thank you to all the panelists for being here. Um, and we uh, have a lot of good things to talk about tonight in terms of what it's going to take to save salmon from extinction. Um, and to get started for this evening, I want to start off with a land acknowledgement. We recognize the unique and enduring relationship that exists between Native people and their traditional territories. We respectfully acknowledge that the lands we live and work on are the traditional lands of Native people who have cared for these lands and waters since time immemorial and continue to do so today. And I want to start tonight by doing a quick round of introductions um, for everyone you're going to be hearing from tonight. I will start with myself. My name is Kate Murphy. I um, am going to be your moderator for the evening. I am a community organizer with Columbia Riverkeeper located in Portland, Oregon, which is on the traditional territories of bands of Chinook, Clackamas, Cowlitz, Kalapuya, Kathlamet, Multnomah, Malala, Tualatin, Wasco, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River. And as part of my work, I'm fortunate to collaborate with local coalitions on working to save salmon from extinction and pushing for removal of the lower uh, Snake River dams. So tonight we are very honored to have our panelists joining us for this conversation. Uh, our first speaker that we're going to hear from tonight is Dr. Sammy Matza. Sammy is a member of the Shoshone Bannock tribes, a water resources research biologist and co-founder of indigenous owned River Nua, an organization founded in partnership with his wife, Jessica. And together they are dedicated to increasing representation and creating spaces of equity through learning experiences on homelands with Shoshone Bannocks, indigenous, and minoritized, minoritized communities on and off the river. Following Sammy, you're gonna be hearing from Rob Crabel. Rob is the Northwest representative with Defenders of Wildlife and Rob's up in Tacoma. Rob is a dedicated conservation advocate working to protect imperiled species across the region, including salmon and orcas and their habitat in the Pacific Northwest. And following Rob tonight, you're going to be hearing from Julia Goodstefani, Julia is the senior attorney with Natural Resources Defense Council, and Julia works to protect marine mammals, wild places, and communities from environmental injustices. Currently, Julia is focused on preventing the extinction of the southern resident orcas by working with partners and allies to restore their primary food source, Chinook salmon, in the Columbia River Basin. And wrapping us up tonight will be Brett Vanden Heuvel. Brett is the executive director with Columbia Riverkeeper, Brett leads Columbia Riverkeeper's policy and legal advocacy work, as well as designing and implementing creative campaigns, including current work to uh, protect and restore Columbia River salmon. Following the speakers tonight, we're gonna use whatever time that we have left over for a Q&A where folks can put their questions in the chat. Um, and since we have a lot to cover, I would love to just jump in and get started. Um, and I would love to pass it to Sammy um to to fill us in thank you sammy for being here thank you for having me i want to say good evening to um um yourself kate and the introduction thank you for that uh but also to rob and julia and brett uh thank you for um having me on this panel and having me be a part of this it's an honor um Julia is starting to become a good friend of uh, our family and she invited me to be here with you all. And um, I appreciate her uh, recommendation to be here tonight and to share with you some of the perspectives around myself and my community and the places where I've grown up and been born into uh, since time immemorial. And so with that, um, just wanted to share with you all tonight, um, just some storytelling I was, uh, not going to present any slides. I just wanted everybody to that's joining us tonight to just um, slow down a bit in yourself and who you are and take a deep breath and um, thank you for being here. And uh, usually we would, uh, in our way, we would, you know, open up this with a prayer and a song and we bring in a group of people that will do that for us. And, um, I just want to acknowledge that we're not doing that and that um, we're creating a space here though for us to at least try to feel comfortable with one another and this is more of a um, setting that is um, 
something more more accustomed to in a contemporary setting, but um, in our traditional ways, we still do these things uh, very much in that way. So um, just want to acknowledge that and also acknowledge that um, the place where I'm speaking from, Shoshone Bennett homeland, the land of my father, and um, also the land of my mother, where I spend time in the summer um, in ceremony. And that's very important for me as a scientist because um, I think in a very Western European context, we tend to be in a world of nouns where we're separating those things out and separating ourselves from them. And um, those things that as you take them apart and atomize the world, um, we tend to get disconnected from who we are. And so I wanna share with you who I am um, and trying to bring the pieces of who I am back together in a way that shares with you what we're talking about in terms of a, a salmon-based culture as a whole ecosystem of who I am uh, and what makes me. And so I'm a husband, a father, um, and a grandfather. And as I've gotten older um, and I see my children and my grandchildren growing up, uh, I remember when uh, my first experience going out and getting salmon and I was around nine years old and we'd done this before but I wasn't aware of what we were doing until then and I hadn't really been aware of that because at the time salmon were so scarce that um, they were hard to come by and that situation has gone from bad to somewhat kind of good um, as I was growing into a young man, there was some pretty good um, salmon returns and I got to experience what it really felt like to be able to look down at a river and see hundreds of salmon come up the river. And um, through the season, there were thousands of salmon that came up that river day after day. And um, I almost can imagine what my ancestors were seeing. And so, um, that situation has changed a lot. We've gone back to bad, probably somewhere around 10 years ago. In the last 10 years, it's even gotten worse. And what it's starting to look like is it's just gonna continue to get worse. And so the, the, the title of our theme tonight is how do, we, um, how do we save our salmon from extinction? And so this has been a key sort of phrase that's been in my life growing up. And how do I uh, participate in that? Because um, as a person who was raised around this, uh, I have to understand that I'm always dealing with the area of disbelief. And my first experience with catching a salmon was hearing stories about them. And uh, we would walk up along these smaller streams and specifically the Yankee Fork of the Salmon River. A, a system that had been dredged up. And so when I went through it, it, was, it looked very alien to me. Um, all of these dredge piles around us, and it was very unnatural. And I think because of that unnatural landscape, that connection with that unnatural landscape and how it was dredged up, and my connection with my family and the memories that I have in that place are all of these interfaces about what has really tra transformed me into becoming a an ecologist and an, an indigenous ecologist and um, an, an ecologist is um, rooted in the word um, home and the study of home and those are the latin words that are basing that word so the study of home and and how i was seeing my home was that the dredge mine had destroyed it and the memories that I had there were um, where I had started to, to be in a place of disbelief. And I think I had inherited that from my ancestors is to look at the land and see it so transformed that they probably would not have recognized it. And to be in that place and here as we're walking along these small streams that there are fish in there. And my dad and my uncle saying that these fish are, they hold them up to their chest. And as they hold them up to their chest, the, their tail is still on the ground and it's folded. And I couldn't believe that as a kid. I was like, no way. There's no way there's fish in here that big. There's no way there's fish that have come to the, from the ocean all the way that way. And they're here now. And my uncles and my dad really 
really searching for these fish. And um, it was getting towards later in the day and we got to this pool. And one of the tools that we were using at the time was like this scope and you could put it in the water. It's just a PVC pipe with a clear piece of um, PVC at the end. And you could see through, see into the pool with it. And my uncle was like, there's one in here, there's one in here. And he's looking down the tube. And uh, my dad goes over with the spear pole. And I remember the spear poles um, that the men had, they, the ends of them were frayed because uh, when the salmon are scarce, the end of the spear is frayed because there's a lot of poking with the spear pole under the banks and under wood piles and the places where we would expect to find salmon. We're trying to poke them and see if they'll come out. If they can come out, then we know that they're there, we can hunt them. And so the end of the spear pole, they're all frayed out at the end. And so that was a real indicator to me that when we are in times of scarcity, high scarcity, that the end of our spear poles are frayed. And um, as I've gotten older, I've come to realize what that spear pole means. And when my dad had that spear pole and he was standing over my uncle and he put the spear pole over directly over his chest, my uncle standing in front with a scope. And as he has that scope in the water, he's aligning, he's taking the spear pole as my dad's standing behind him, he's putting it down close to the salmon and he holds it. And as he's holding it, he's, there's a signal they already know. They already know all of the, the things and how they're gonna happen. And so as he's sitting there, he's holding the scope and he's holding the spear pole at the same time and he's lining my dad up and he pushes back on the spear pole. And that tells my dad to push down hard as he can, pushes down as hard as he can. And that salmon pulls back, and sets the hook, takes off, pulls my dad into the pool. My dad comes out the other side of the pool and he comes up with the spear pole and he brings it up onto this bank. And sure enough, there was this big, huge salmon that came out of the water. And I was a believer. I believe so much in our culture and our beliefs and our way of life that it made me want to pursue the career that I have the fortunate career that I have to be able to do this work every day, to be involved in these communities who care about our salmon. And for us, I've shared this um, with other audiences, but um, for us, that's our knowledge. That's who we are. And you probably heard our people in the Columbia River Basin say that the salmon is us and we are the salmon. But really that's, those salmon go extinct. You could basically lobotomize it because that part of our that part of our brain will be gone. That part of our spirit, that part of our soul, the part of our life. And I've I've tried to relate that to non-native audiences and the idea that if you took all of your memories of Socrates or Aristotle and you took them away and you made them disappear, you made them go extinct. That's very similar to what I'm talking about. That's how deep this sits inside my soul and in my mind and in my spirit. And so when I'm talking this way and, and I'm talking about where, where we are on the land now, that direct interface between how we bring salmon back and how we bring our people back, those are very much the same thing. Me as a biologist and as an ecologist, as a scientist, I understand statistics. I also understand that our community has deficit statistics. And I would say those deficit statistics of a human population and a salmon population are one and the same. And that when we talk about these connections to who our salmon are and who we are, we are seeing the same challenges and we can relate that and through my wife's work. Her work in the high school is that she's basically working in our own hatchery system where we've taken our children and we put them in boxes. And in those boxes, there's a teacher at the front of the room, there's rows of desks, and those, those kids are being situated into a world that is dominating them, just like taking a wild salmon out of the wild and putting it into a hatchery. It's put in a raceway. And at the end of the raceway, there's a hatchery manager who's feeding them and teaching them habits that we now know from hatchery reform that haven't been good for those fish. 
those fish have been taught how to eat off the top of the water. So then they, as they leave the, the hatchery, they become prey to birds. They are in a raceway where they become more like couch potatoes and they don't know how to swim in a wild river anymore. They are um, sometimes put in such conditions that they have to control their growth. So they uh, will feed them less and then they start nipping at each other and fighting with each other because they're in these concrete raceways and in, in these uh, places where the densities are high. They're not in the condition that they can be able to be a wild salmon again. And so through that reform, and even through our tribal high school, where my wife works, her work is also through a, a situation of reforming the education system so that we can get our kids out of those places to get them back on land, to then be, uh, again, back in their places where their knowledge systems are. Those knowledge systems being, in a salmon-based culture, many things, plants and animals that are all a part of that salmon ecosystem. It's not just one animal, it's not just one species. That salmon is connected to everything. And through ecology, we have started to realize this, that the salmon are in the top of the trees, that they are carried in the, in the, in the guts of birds and the carcasses of, that wolves drag into the, to the forest, more so than the bears. We tend to, send, to, tend to talk more about bears and salmon, but actually wolves do a lot of that work. And so and that, all of that ecosystem is what we, we were interacting with, what we were learning from, which is shaping us as a people and our culture, shaped us in who we are today. And we survived because of them. And our stories even say that the salmon gave their life so that ours may go on. And many tribes talk that way about their very central foods of who they are that is part of that landscape. In my mom's country, they talk about the buffalo. You go further back east, they talk about the maples, the maple trees. All of these plants and animals, they, they in, in so many ways, we say those things. And it's, a, it's an English translation to say that through this observation and through this connection and through our dreams and through our prayers, these plants and these animals, they showed themselves to us in so many ways. So that when we go back to those memory traces on land, and if they're not dredged up, we can still find our trails because we learned from the animals, they taught us how to cross the land. They read the land. They knew where the water was. They know where the plants are to eat. They know where the plants are for medicine. They knew the path of least resistance. Those pathways were then turned into wagon trails. Those wagon trails were turned into highways. They're, we're still here. We're just underneath things. We're buried. And we've talked about this as well. With Julia and other conversations about every time we look out our window on even on our reservation land we see tractors going back and forth and they're just big erasers erasing us from the land and so it's a struggle for us and, and so when I talk about us being in a salmon ecosystem that salmon eco ecosystem is under threat every day all the time and it's becoming more and more relevant that the situation that we are in is unsustainable and that those words about sustainability, adaptive management, climate change, those are all rising to the surface now because those are conditions of what we've primarily been living behind, which is colonialism. And that colonialism has not been good for any of us. And so when you're making this land acknowledgement, we're talking about whose land we're on. We also have to realize the conditions that come with that and to take it a step further. And so in this conversation tonight, we want to talk about this Simpson concept and to remove, remove the four lower snake dam, to free the snake. And in that conversation, it's going to take more than just words and land acknowledgement, that it's going to take action and activity, us coming together as community in a process of decolonization. And that decolonization is a very inclusive statement. It is part of what I'm going through. And I challenge everybody in the audience to also start to work on that. Because if we call this place home, and whether my ancestors have been here for thousands of years, or your ancestors have only been here for hundreds of years or less, if you're gonna call this place home, and you're gonna call yourself a native or Oregonian or 
uh, Idahoan or whatever state you're from, then live up to that. Live up to your place on the land and start taking this, take, taking care of this place like it's home. Because for us, those things, when we say them and our ancestors say them and our elders say them, who would do that to their home? Who would sell their mother? And so I will I'll leave you with those thoughts and those ideas and we'll come back to a Q&A and we can revisit them. And um, I really want people to understand that we're not talking about a fish. We're talking about a people that are connected to a fish very deeply, very intimately, so much so that this is the attention, the affection, and the nurturing that we give our children and that we give to the land. That connection between us and them is so important. So it, it is far more important than maybe you'll ever realize, but I hope that at least what we share in this effort towards trying to save them from extinction, that maybe we can start to find some places that we really start to hear each other and really start to work towards um, undoing a lot of the history that's between us. And I don't want to burden everybody with that idea. These are steps, I'm working on them, my wife's working on them, my community, we're working with a community on these things. Colonialism took 500 years to get to where we are today. If this is the turning point, hopefully in another 500 years, we'll be in a better place. And so that burden isn't on everybody to feel like there's a heavy weight on you tonight to do something from here forward. The, the, it's steps. Take the steps. Someone said to me today, as I cautioned about some of the pitfalls of interacting with academic institutions in our tribe, is that he said there's no guidebook for this. And he is a very intelligent professor at a university. And he said that to me. And I, I would I say, no, there is a guidebook. There's very good scholarly work out there. There is research around this. There are people doing the work. Um, me and my wife are doing this work. And we don't do it without doing it on the shoulders of our ancestors and our relatives and the people who are also um, writing about these issues. Very good, very good topics that you can Google around decolonizing methodology, about steps to be um, better at cultural competency and cultural relevancy. Because if you're not good at those things, you're just going to continue to extract from indigenous knowledge and indigenous ways of knowing. And that's where the harm is. And so if you don't understand the interface, then it's going to be hard to have a relationship. So I'll leave you with that cultural competency, cultural relevancy, and how we talk about indigenous knowledge and what that means. Um, so with that, uh, thank you again. It's been an honor to be with you this evening. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I look forward to your questions and the other panelists who are going to present tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sammy, really for sharing your perspective and for also grounding our conversation in the understanding that this is all so interconnected and we are all working for the same things in so many ways. And, you know, our waters are connected, all of the things that you talked about, how much uh, part salmon are of, of every part of our surroundings and our ecosystem and um, really grounding us there because we do get caught up a lot of times in these policy conversations and time to make decisions. And I think that when we approach these conversations, it's so valuable to be able to ground ourselves in this uh, uh, looking forward towards what we're trying to protect, right? So thank you for setting the tone in that way and for sharing your perspective with us. Um, with that, we are gonna get a little bit more into the Simpson plan and I'm going to pass it to Rob to cover that for us. Thank you, Rob. Awesome. Thank you, Kate. And thank you, Sammy, for setting the stage so nicely. Um, I couldn't have had a better introduction. Um, so as uh, Sammy mentioned, the Simpson proposal, which is called the Columbia Basin Fund, is a really exciting and new opportunity being discussed in Congress right now to not only breach the four lower Snake River dams, but make big investments in salmon restoration and infrastructure throughout the Pacific Northwest. Um, I'm a maps and visual guy, so I am going to share my screen and uh, just share a couple of slides here uh, quickly. 
grade. So I first wanted to start off uh, just by showing us and introducing us to the Columbia Basin since we're talking about the Columbia Basin Fund. Um, this is the large watershed that many folks here tonight live in. Um, I do not. I am out in uh, Tacoma in the Puyallup watershed on the Puyallup, on the land of the Puyallup Nation. Um, but this large watershed uh, cuts through uh, the majority of eastern Washington. It defines the border of Oregon and Washington. And the largest tributary to the Columbia is the Snake River here, which uh, also uh, borders Oregon and Idaho and has its headwaters in Grand Tetons National Park. Uh, you can also see that there are a lot of dams throughout this system. Uh, the Pacific Northwest is one of the most heavily dammed regions in the entire world. Uh, many of these large hydropower dams were built 70 to 100 years ago and were built to both provide power to the Northwest as well as other services like irrigation, transportation, and a whole host of other things. Um, but of course, dams have severe impacts on fish and wildlife and their habitats, which other speakers will talk about later tonight, uh, as well as indigenous peoples, as Sammy mentioned earlier. Many of the dams here flooded traditional Indian village sites, as well as uh, some very uh, historically popular and important areas to harvest salmon uh, from the folks who have and continue to live in the basin. Uh, specifically tonight, though, we're talking about the Lower Snake River. So down here in this uh, southeast corner of Washington and the dams there. Um, these dams are particularly egregious, uh, and uh, that's been the focus of many organizations and individuals to remove them. And removing them, though, is going to be complex because this is a very complex system. Um, a lot of the wheat that is grown in eastern Washington and eastern Oregon is shipped along the Snake River and the Columbia River system. And while salmon runs are still not nearly as big as they uh, once were, the Columbia Basin is still one of the largest salmon producers in the West Coast. And that supports fisheries, whether it be recreational fisheries, ocean fisheries, or tribal fisheries that rely on these salmon, both to support uh, communities and economies, as well as to feed folks. Other wildlife, like the endangered southern resident orcas, are also extremely dependent on what happens in the Columbia Basin system. Um, they do spend a lot of time in Puget Sound and the Salish Sea, but they also spend a lot of time up and down the coast searching for salmon there. And lastly, many municipalities, including the one that I rely on for my power, get their energy from Bonneville Power, which markets the energy from these dams. So because there are a lot of different components that will be impacted by decisions to the hydropower, that means that any solution that we come up with also has to be multifaceted and address a lot of these issues. That's where the Columbia Basin Fund comes in. This is a proposal that was put forward by Congressman Mike Simpson in February. And the underlying uh, idea behind the Columbia Basin Fund, it started with wanting to recover salmon and restore the Lower Snake River. But the next question that was asked was, if we remove these dams, what else do we need to do to make sure that people who currently rely on them remain resilient and strong? So the underlying approach that this fund is taking is to try to make sure that we are investing in all sectors that will be impacted, both positively and negatively from this decision, and make sure that everybody who is involved is uh, better off because of the proposal that moves forward. Um, this is also a really exciting opportunity for us for several reasons, politically speaking. Um, this is a proposal to breach four dams coming from a Republican. Um, that's something that I don't think any of us on this call were necessarily expecting, so it provides a really great opportunity to build great bipartisan support, especially since high-profile Democrats like Governor Kate Brown in Oregon have expressed their support for a similar approach. Um, this is also a great opportunity because the core, uh, really one of the, the main focuses of this fund is infrastructure. And as many of you know, infrastructure is the next big project that is going to be tackled by this upcoming Congress. So there's a lot of different factors that are playing into making this a prime opportunity for us to make big investments in infrastructure and salmon recovery at the exact same time. Now, that being said, this proposal that was offered up by Congressman Simpson is just an initial opening to uh, a broader conversation about the infrastructure and salmon recovery needs of the entire region. 
Um, this sort of quick rundown is from the perspective of my organization, Defenders of Wildlife, although I know many other environmental groups share some of these concerns. Um, but this is the Columbia Basin Fund by the numbers. So first, uh, it's a lot of money that we're talking about. Uh, almost $34 billion would be invested in various sectors. Um, there would be $12 billion invested in renewable energy replacement and grid optimization. That's going to be important for when the Lower Snake River dams are removed, that that energy is still being produced and not producing carbon uh, dioxide. There's also $3 billion invested into watershed restoration, and that includes significant amounts of money to other watersheds, not just those along the, the Snake or Columbia Rivers. And then lastly, there's a $1.5 billion uh, uh, there's $1.5 billion that would be invested into expanding uh, grain transportation options. So that's uh, primarily rail is, would be the alternative that grain growers would use to move their agriculture from uh, field out to market. Uh, in terms of some of the policy aspects of this proposal, um, this is where you start to see some of the, the good and the bad balance. Um, from my perspective, one of the best things in this proposal is that the four Lower Snake River dams would be breached. It, it's long overdue that it's time to, to get those dams out and to restore that river. Um, excitingly, this proposal also has some new governance structures proposed for the Columbia Basin, including something called the Northwest State and Tribal Fish and Wildlife Council. Um, this would create a more uh, formal entity where state managers and tribal governments are able to discuss fish and wildlife and salmon recovery uh, measures at a co-manager government to government consultation level. Um, there's also a lot of investments in energy storage, especially in the Lower Snake River uh, Center, in the Lower Snake River area to advance energy storage and to continue advancing Washington's role as a renewable, north, uh, renewable energy leader. Um, and it would also invest, create a national recreation area along the Lower Snake River. Um, this would be an exciting opportunity because there's over 80 different whitewater rapids underneath the reservoirs in those dams right now. And prior to dam construction, people from all over the world came to the Lower Snake River to raft those rapids. Um, there's also a lot of different policies in there that tribal governments have been asking for, specifically increased passage for lamprey at various dams, as well as restoring salmon to uh, areas in the upper Columbia that they've been extricated from, uh, such as above Chief Joe and Grand Coulee Dam. So those are some of the good things in there. Uh, some of the more concerning aspects of the proposal right now is that Lower Snake River Dam breaching wouldn't happen for another 10 years. Um, the idea is that they want to create time for infrastructure to be put in place to help with the transition. But if we really want to stop salmon from, be, from going extinct, we have to act on a much quicker timeline. Um, there's also proposals in there to extend the license and lifetime of other dams throughout the Columbia Basin up to 50 years. Um, some of those dams are more problematic than others, so it's concerning that there would be blanket uh, extension of those licenses. It would also suspend bedrock environmental laws at many of the dams along the Columbia River that would remain. That includes preventing environmental groups from bringing lawsuits against uh, operations that violate the Clean Water Act or the Endangered Species Act. Um, there is also a lack of clarity and oversight in a couple of different aspects of the proposal that needs more definition to it. Um, so those are some of the different components of the proposal. There's a lot more detail in there, and I encourage folks who really want to get into the wonky weeds to go to the uh, congressman's website. But the last thing that I'll say about this is that all of this is just a starting place for a conversation. Um, this is the initial opening that a member of Congress has put forward to the region to start a broader discussion about what we need for infrastructure and salmon recovery. So our goal is to continue this discussion. We really need to make sure that members of Congress, especially Democrats, can come to the table and negotiate with Congressman Simpson to make sure that these bad elements are removed or lessened in the proposal and really maximize the good elements as much as possible. Um, so that is a very quick and brief overview of the uh, Columbia Basin Fund. And with that, Kate, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Rob. I know that's like a lot of stuff to cover in a short amount of time. And that's true for all the speakers today. I really appreciate everyone working within this 
confined context of time limits to talk about these really big complex issues. Um, and yes, as Rob said, if folks want to learn more about the plan, there's a lot more to it. So definitely go check it out. Um, I also um, want to welcome Julia to talk to us some more about some of the specific things that are going on um, in terms of some of the litigation and um, talking to us about energy issues and, of course, uh, the Southern Resident Market. So I'll pass to you, Julia. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Kate, um, for the invitation uh, and the introduction. It is uh, an honor to sit with all of you in this uh, virtual discussion, uh, and I really appreciate it. Sammy's words about um, how we create a, a, a space, you know, I think it's something that we don't often um, put enough intention around, but I too uh, would like to welcome you all into the, to the conversation and the chat. And I think this is uh, an imperative to dis discussion to be having in this moment. Um, I'm gonna give a little bit of background and history. Uh, I, I've been asked to talk about and sort of my, my points of contact here. First, because I'm an attorney, I'll talk about the litigation a little bit. Um, uh, in, I'm trying my best to keep it in a story so that uh, I don't bore you with the details. Uh, um, but I'll do that quickly. And then the Southern Residence, which is Orcas, which is where my heart is in this story and how I found my way uh, up the Columbia. Um, and then end uh, with a, a little bit of discussion about our energy future, um, which is also, you know, really what this infrastructure package is about and a lot of people are talking about and how the hydropower came to be. Um, so I, uh, I am a, a, a mom of two little ones and a sister and um, a daughter and a, a resident of Mosier, Oregon here along uh, the Columbia and I've I fell in love with this place uh, in my late teens um, and that love has continued. And I've been very fortunate that I had a, I landed a job uh, after law school to work in the oceans program to save marine mammals from extinction, uh, which sounded pretty amazing uh, to have marine mammals as clients. And then found my way uh, about seven or eight years ago to the Southern resident orcas and was asked uh, to take a look at this very endangered population of whales. And essentially the question was, what can be done? What can we do to help prevent the, um, the loss of this just amazing family of whales? And learning about the whales, uh, very quickly I discovered that their, their principal threat um, was a lack of food. Uh, and they, above all else, eat Chinook salmon. Uh, they, their jaws are not designed, this population of orcas, to be able to handle eating mammals. They eat fish. Um, and when there are multiple kinds of fish around, they will preferentially eat Chinook. That is just the fish they like. And it turns out uh, we have learned by studying their scat uh, that they eat in the winter and spring months, ab above all other kinds of salmon, they eat Columbia Basin salmon. Uh, and more than 50% of their diet is comes, originates in the Columbia Basin. So I started looking uh, gladly in my own back door uh, and yard and uh, river uh, at what could be done here in the Columbia Basin. And, um, it, you know, the story is complex. Uh, it, uh, I, I thought orca, there was so much orca science and uh, I couldn't believe how much uh, salmon science there is. And people here in my town uh, joke sometimes that we have more fish biologists than fish in the river these days. Um, not in any way to disparage Sammy's significant contributions and importance. Uh, we need every single one of those biologists. Um, so that brings me to the litigation story that I want to tell. And I started to dig about what had happened here uh, in this place that I love. And, you know, a bunch of dams were built up and down the river. They've created these large reservoirs that we, those of you who drive along Highway 84 the way I do, you know. And uh, the dams were built, I would say, 
with a very modest understanding of the impact of the fish. I, I do believe there was an understanding uh, and a disregard for the impact on the fish, but we have since really, we can't hide from the truth of what the impact of the hydropower system has been on those salmon populations here. Um, and I apologize, I don't know if you're picking up the background noise. Uh, okay, good. I uh, rent an office because I have little ones uh, and I live in a rural place. So for high bandwidth and quiet, I rent an office, but I can't control when they decide to clean the building, uh, which I'm grateful for. Uh, so um, in the 90s, a lot, oh, you know, decades after the dams were built, salmon started getting listed as endangered. Uh, because we started to really understand that the, all of this had been built and constructed with federal permits and permission, these are federally authorized dams, uh, without uh, reg proper regard for the salmon, and the salmon were indeed uh, on their way towards extinction. And what a lot of people don't understand is actually the current hydropower system, the main stem Columbia dams and the Snake River dams are illegal. They are in violation, present violation, and have been for decades of the Endangered Species Act. They have not, the federal agencies thus far, have failed to demonstrate that they can operate these dams in such a way that does not jeopardize the continued existence of salmon. Uh, that's a big problem um, if you want to continue to have salmon in this ecosystem and you believe, as I do, that they are the backbone of this ecosystem. So the Litigation um, has marched forward. There have been five rounds in federal court, the most recent culminating in 2016 with a 149 page opinion by Judge Simon that resoundingly found, again, that the dams are in violation of the Endangered Species Act. The agencies were tasked, again, with um, completing a biological opinion and endangered um, well, an environmental impact statement and all of the, the proper paperwork. And uh, that process got expedited under the Trump administration, uh, mandated to be completed within Trump's uh, years. Um, at, instead of finishing in 2021, it was finished in 2020, and it looks much the same. Uh, and I, you know, I believe there are, there are um, good people working on this project. Uh, I don't want to suggest otherwise, but it is very frustrating from the outside to see uh, and the judges are frustrated that have looked at this. Uh, it's frustrating um, both as a, as a lawyer, you know, to feel the futility sometimes of this tool that you uh, really want to believe in, which is the law, uh, which is why I'm here, right? I'm not writing a brief or, or trying to think up the next brilliant legal argument. I, uh, I think we have so much education to do and hearts and minds to move. Uh, in order to get us there. And that really is where a lot of our collective energy needs to be. Um, so I am, you know, the next round of litigation has started up. The plaintiffs have filed. The state of Oregon has joined. Uh, the Spokane tribe of Indians has joined. We, uh, I don't think I've seen papers from the Nez Perce tribe, but they've been long-standing participants. Uh, and, and I, you know, support the, the, the effort uh, and I uh, truly hope um, that that continues to put tr tremendous um, pressure on the system uh, to do better by salmon. And similarly, at the same time, I think we also need to start thinking about other avenues for change um, and recognize that courts and litigation are limited in what they can do. Uh, so the, and the urgency is on all sides. Uh, you know, it's, um, the urgency is there for the salmon. We have climate change pressing down on us. NOAA's latest study I thought was just really astounding uh, found, um, looked at eight uh, Snake River populations and found that uh, there was a 75% likelihood that they would, even the largest populations would be extinct by 2060 under current climate conditions. So uh, the, and the southern res the outlook for the southern resident orcas uh, is not better uh, for those of you that know them. They have, they're down to very few re reproductive females at this point. They are skinny, they are losing their calves. And, um, and that, it, to me, that uh, illness that we're seeing and that um, struggle in the natural world is reflected in our own, um, you know, in our own struggles. We are deeply connected to a place to the water, to the, uh, to the species around us. Um, and the healing needs to happen on all sides. So I am 
grateful to be part of the discussion tonight. Uh, I will end with just a note on the energy piece, which is, you know, there was an early round of energy development out here in the West, and it really, um, you know, we, we uh, built a ton of energy and we use energy every day. Uh, and at the same time, we can do better. And this is a moment to where a lot of money is at play uh, to rebuild the infrastructure um, and to reconsider it. And we are seeing uh, the need for that and, and a great possibility. So lots of studies have been done there too. We can remove the Lower Snake River dams and replace them with clean alternatives. This is not a choice um, that uh, demands fossil fuels. It must be done thoughtfully and with planning and with the, with the right um, you know, sort of upgrades to transmission and uh, you know, additional uh, integration of renewables, but uh, it can be achieved and I, I believe that. Uh, so happy to answer questions on all three fronts in the Q&A and thank you for, again, for inviting me. Julia, thank you so much for really sharing your expertise on those issues. I think, you know, as we've talked about, this is such a complex issue and a lot of different folks who care about this issue for different reasons. So thank you for, for lending your expertise there. And I want to now pass to our final speaker of the evening before we do our Q&A. Um, and that is Brett Vanden Heuvel from Columbia Riverkeeper. Thank you, Brett. Yeah, thanks, Kate, and everybody for joining tonight. Um, this is a really important topic, and it it uh, warms my heart that people are tuning in on your on your evening to share your experiences and learn more about this. And so, I, I want to talk about, um, and I want to hear from you all in in a, in a bit. Um, but the the urgency of this. Uh, moment right now. So the urgency to restore salmon. We're really at a tipping point. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and then um, also why now is the time, like what's different. You know, there's been, like Rob mentioned earlier, there's been long-standing discussion and efforts to remove the Snake River dams and, um, but it's different now. And, and we at Columbia Riverkeeper have, you know, dedicated time and effort and, and making this a priority campaign along with a lot of other organizations because we think that that it's a real it's something that can be done. Um, and then we also want to touch on what what you can do about um, in, in the next steps and Kate's going to share some of that at the end. Um, but I'll, I'll touch on that as well. So I just want to just start by um, I have, I think, two slides or two or three I want to share with you here um, to talk about some of the urgency. <clears throat> so, and, and some of you know these stories, these stories well, but the, you know, we know that removing the lower Snake River dams will allow salmon to migrate up to cold water habitat in intact um, beautiful areas in, in Idaho and will allow them to more fish to reach these spawning grounds. Um, one thing that's not as well known that has really caught our attention over the last five, six, seven years is the uh, another big threat and another reason to remove dams is how hot the water is in the Snake River right now and the Columbia River for that matter. And this is a photo of an adult sockeye that was probably headed to Idaho in 2015. And I'm just going to give an example of, of what happens. And in 2015, it, the water was really hot and it was a hot temperature in the air. It was a low water year. There was these factors that came together and we had a massive salmon die off, massive sockeye die off. Um, the, the sockeye run up to Columbia here in June and it, the, the river got very hot that quickly that year. And so 250,000 sockeye died because the river was too hot. Um, you know, salmon, as you know, are a cold water species. They need cool water to survive in the dams create these shallow reservoirs that are stagnant. The water heats up by absorbing solar radiation and um, the dams are causing the hot water problem. And you put climate change on top of that and it gets worse. And so 
they're stressed out, they're getting fungus. Um, this is a screenshot from a USGS video um, on a tributary of the Columbia here in the gorge where I live where thousands of fish are swimming around in circles. Um, many of them, you know, stressed and covered with fungus and essentially waiting to die. And so sockeye spawn in high water, high elevation lakes, um, you know, near, near Sammy's country. And they don't go in the tributaries in the lower Columbia where I live. And a biologist friend called me and said, hey, there's sockeye here, thousands of them in the Wind River swimming around in circles. Um, and they're essentially waiting to die. And the water was so hot that year that for the first time in, in human history, uh, that, well, that human caused pollution turned around a run of salmon. They, they have um, pit tags, they put, they put um, sensors in the fish and they can tell when they go through dams. So these fish, this run, run of sockeye swam up through Bonneville's swam up through the Dells, swam up through John Day, swam up through Umatilla, and they were getting hotter and hotter and hotter and literally turned around, came back down through the dams and were holding up in some of these cold water tributaries because they couldn't go any farther. Um, and, you know, many of the federal government was saying this was an anomaly, that 2015 was a very strange year. And it was, it was hot earlier, but this can't be dismissed as an anomaly. This is, this is a window into our future. And so if we don't do something about the hot water crisis on the Snake River and on the Columbia for that matter, um, the spawning habitat may not matter because these fish aren't um, going to be able to migrate even up through the Columbia and the Snake Rivers and in the Snake River. And so one of the best things we can do that we know to cool water temperature is to get rid of the reservoirs, to get rid of the dams that cause the reservoirs. And um, I want to show you, uh, th this, is, this is a slide of Bonneville and this, this same trend could be, um, is this very similar for all the Columbia River dams and the Snake River dams, but this is just showing from the 1940s to basically current, the red is the trend line of the temperature here, the average August temperature. But without dwelling on this too much, um, you know, 20 degrees C is the safe temperature for, for salmon for migration. And yeah, sometimes it gets above that at times, but the, the trend line here is that it's getting hotter. Um, we're gonna have some years that are warmer and some years that are colder, but it's, it's getting hotter as we put in more dams and as our climate warms up. So one more, <clears throat> one more chart and then I'll, I'll get out of here. Um, this is some modeling that, that we did with um, <clears throat> a temperature modeler from, from Yale that was looking at this year of 2015, which we think is a window into the future, that measured the actual temperatures on the Snake River. So the chart on the left is the four lower Snake River dams and that blue line, the blue horizontal line is, is 68 degrees. That's the safe level for salmon. So anything above that, the, the salmon aren't safely traveling, migrating up to, to spawn. And so you'll see here, you know, from basically mid-June through September, it's too hot, it's unsafe. And this is what actual happened. This is, you know, from taking temperature readings in the water. And the chart on the right is some modeling of what it would look like if we take out the dams. So you'll see the other side saying things like, well, the dams are, the rivers are already too hot. So the dams aren't, you know, the, the dams aren't making that big of a difference. And the punchline here is if we take out the dams, the, the, this is obvious, but there's not going to be reservoirs and the river is going to be much cooler. And so I think an interesting point is there are times of the year, you know, it spiked in July, it spiked in August when it does exceed that 68 degrees and the salmon can handle that, right? They're very resilient. They can handle it for that two week period. Um, but if it's three months of suffocating, you know, heat and lack of oxygen, um, increased predators, then that is very, very uh, detrimental and, and deadly for salmon. Um, and so 
I just want to share, share a quick story here too. You know, I, I had the pleasure of working on the White Salmon River and advocating for the Condit Dam to be removed. And this was a, you know, much smaller, this was at the time the, the largest dam removal in the US, and, but it has been eclipsed by the Elwha Dam and will soon be eclipsed by Klamath Dams. And, but, and, and hopefully the Snake River Dams will be the ultimate um, end you know, to, to this story. But on the Condit Dam, the, there was a lot of opposition to it, um, the removal. Klickitat County, which is a very conservative county, was fighting against it. And um, people were saying, you know, if we re the, the salmon are going to take years and years or decades to, um, to recolonize. And I got, I got this work for many years on advocating for this dam removal. And, you know, we're there when they put the dynamite in and blew a big hole and the reservoir drained. And it was this exciting thing. My kids were very young at the time and got to show them. And, and we went back the next year. And this is an amazing photo of a salmon that had returned to the white salmon. Uh, you know, less than a year after dam removal, um, going to a place where no salmon had been in over a hundred years. Um, so I, I am no, I am not a biologist. I'm a, I'm an attorney like Julia, but um, you know, the, the, the idea that if we just take the blockages out of the river, then um, amazing things can happen. Um, so, the, the, the urgency, I mean, I think the hot water issue is an extremely, um, is, adds to the urgency of this, um, and it's probably not getting enough attention. And then the, the why is the time, why now? Um, you know, this Simpson proposal, I'll, I'll be honest, like, you know, you start talking about, uh, moratoriums on, on litigation, which we do a lot of, and it, and it, you know, gives us all pause. And as Rob did a good job of explaining, like, we think this is the starting point. There's, there's things in there that we do not like that we're going to fight against and, and hope to make better. Um, but it is just a concept. It's a proposal. There's no legislative language. And so what we're, um, I see this as a once in a lifetime opportunity where the conversation is around Snake River Dam removal. There's a lot of money being proposed to restore salmon. And we have, um, we have the Northwest delegation is in positions of power. You know, we have probably the, the strongest leadership positions we've had in a long time. And so what can we do about it? We need to mobilize in a big way to take on this big problem. And we need the leadership of our Northwest delegation, particularly, you know, Senators Wyden, Murray, Cantwell, Merkley, um, here in Oregon where I live, Representative Fazio is in a very powerful position. So not, not just them, but they, um, they can take this on and make it a primary issue for them and really move the ball on this. So it's an exciting time. It's a daunting time, but, um, you know, re referencing back to what, what Sammy was talking about, this, this work to prevent salmon from going extinct is, um, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine a much more important thing for conservation groups and people who care about the Columbia River, the Snake River, and, and orcas to be working on right now. Um, this is it, and we have a great opportunity. Um, so I will wrap with that, and I hope you all get to ask some questions to folks, and, and I know Kate wanted to um, share some more details and links of how folks can, can take action on this. Thank you so much, Brett. Um... Yeah, it's just such an important issue. And I think you all have covered different aspects of, of the importance of this issue really well tonight. And I know there's so much more to it. Um, and, and we're trying to cover this all in a quick hour and a half and really appreciate all that you have um, said tonight and the perspective you shared. I wanna invite folks who are listening to um, ask the, any questions you have into the chat. I just shared a bunch of links in the chat that are gonna be useful for folks as we move forward. 
after we do a Q&A, it might come up in the Q&A, there's a few action pieces that are in the, in the chat. Um, and so definitely want to invite folks to add their questions in there. Uh, we'll try to get to as many of them as we can in the time that we have. Um, I do have a couple already that I've pulled. Uh, and I'm going to start with a question for Sammy. And this question is, can you talk to us a bit more about the topics of cultural competency and cultural relevancy and some of the boundaries for non-tribal people to be aware of in terms of speaking about and sharing ind indigenous knowledge? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Just been listening with uh, not saying anything so my voice gets to come back. Um, so cultural competency is just the ability to understand where does my culture end and where does another culture begin. Um, in our teachings, we talk about not mixing medicine. And so medicine can be knowledge, medicine can be literally medicine for your body, um, but how you mix, um, how those are mixed could be even um, brought to the idea of assimilation. And so we tend to talk about um, the effects of assimilation in the boarding schools. Um, so children being taken from their parents and put into the boarding school systems uh, here in the US and also in Canada. And those uh, assimilation processes are very traumatic. And so we try to be careful about how we say that idea about having two cultures interacting with one another. And so cultural competency is, when I, so uh, like, so even I, I'll joke around about this and I'll say, oh yeah, you know, I'm an aquatic, I do aquatic ecology and I, I understand uh, etymology. And I'll say, oops, sorry, I didn't mean etymology, I meant entomology. And um, etymology, of course, the study of the basis and the origins of words or etymolo entomology, which is aquatic insects. Uh, some people don't really understand like the, the, the use of words and how important they are. And so that idea about how a word is being used. Uh, so when I say an ecologist, the study of home, um, that for me really resonates with how I found my career in this idea about this destructive place and being in salmon restoration in the Yankee Fork where it was dredge mined. Um, so once you start doing that, what happens is then you can, you can then situate culture. And this was done very good tonight. So putting a, a native person at the beginning to open the conversation rather than at the end to foreground the cultures that are uh, intimately tied into the issues that we're talking about such as salmon restoration that is very appropriate and to understand what's appropriate and not offend people and cause more harm that's the issues where we get into talking about when i'm talking about my way of life and the the ways that i was raised those are mine those are our culture that's where we come from and when we share those, we share them uh, as a gift, but we also don't share them to be taken away from us and turned into something else. And so that's where that danger comes from, where the harm is caused, is if you get into this extractive process to make, to purify it, right? That's that purity of like mining. So if you mine the earth, you're taking a, a, a singular ore out of the ground. It's the same thing with our knowledge. Something gets singularly taken out of it, out of context. And when it's taken out of context, of course, you have to deal with tailings and pollution and chemicals that get used in that process. It's a, it's a metaphor to the actual situation of how we interact in cultural competency and then where relevancy is uh, of cultures becomes important. And then um, what we're centering in those conversations and narratives and then how are we safely interacting with culture so that I am not stealing or taking from that culture anymore? I hope that's helpful. That's really helpful, Sammy. Thank you for taking time to explain that for us. And, and actually, if I could kind of piggyback onto that question with a follow-up question, um, can you talk to us about some of the ways that non-tribal folks can support Native communities that are doing this work in a, in a manner that doesn't perpetuate this historical harm um, that, that has been experienced. Yeah, there's some organizations, so such as my, my you mentioned earlier, my wife, my wife and myself were co-founders of River Nua. It's an indigenous owned nonprofit. We are trying to get young people out on land to interact in these natural landscapes. There are also 
amongst the Columbia River Basin. There's the um, River Warriors up in the Colville around the Spokane tribes. There is Nimi Poo protecting the environment with the Nez Perce people. Um, there's other organizations around the Columbia River Basin that's just to name a few, um, but just find who they are, support them, support the work that they're doing. Um, there are big nonprofit organizations out there, a couple people here representing some of those. Uh, we would like to have that kind of um, abilities to make that kind of change in the, in the land and be able to have the ability to have a, a larger funding force of people who can be at these uh, gatherings. Uh, we're very limited in our resources. Me and Jessica are, are spread very thin. Um, not that we don't uh, uh, want to be in all the places, it's that we have to prioritize. And so this is a very important uh, venue. And in order for us to be at important venues, to have our voice there, to speak appropriately, um, we need support. And we would appreciate anybody's support out there for us and the work we're doing. And thank you, for, uh, thank you, Kate, for um, allowing us to um, talk about that. Thank you. Thank you, Sammy, for, for sharing that with us. And I think it is really important that we ask these questions and have these conversations. I know, you know, we don't want to not have these conversations for fear of, of feeling uncomfortable, right? So they can sometimes be difficult. And I think it's really important um, so that we can learn how best to support each other. And um, so appreciate your, your input on that for sure. I do have another question that came in. Um, this question I'm going to toss up for anyone who wants to jump in. It is, how can we apply the lessons learned from other successful dam removal projects? Uh, well, I may kick us off. I think one of the biggest lessons that I've learned from uh, some of the past dam removal projects, uh, the Elwha comes to mind immediately since uh, it's right in my backyard. Uh, the fish come back a lot faster and a lot stronger than the folks normally predict them to come back. So, you know, I think um, we have a lot of great models that show really promising returns for salmon following uh, dam breaching on the lower snake. And uh, my hope is that the fish will continue to blow our expectations out of the water um, and just really uh, recolonize and, and reestablish their range in those upper basins. I think I can just quickly add to that, if that's okay. Um, on the on the Conda Dam on the White Salmon River, the the economic impact was really interesting. Um, you know, I mean, not only was it restoring salmon habitat and and you know ultimately increasing numbers but the the construction crews um and the you know it was employing a lot of local folks of heavy equipment operators of you know biologists and and i, I still remember there was a it was called james dean construction and they were this you know the the local heavy equipment operators and they put up this big sign that after all this opposition, after 10 years of opposition, I, I don't know about them personally, but um, they had James Dean construction dam demolition at their headquarters site out there by the river. And they were amazing. I mean, they were artists with the equipment and they, they literally removed the dams. Now you go down there and you can't even see where it was. And they were very proud and it turned into this big job creation and, um, and kind of community pride of how you know how great of a job they did and so um you know this can you, the removing the snake or breaching the snake river dams and how are the different mechanisms that we're talking about doing this but it's going to be a huge infrastructure projects and you know creating more rail and and certainly there's going to be a lot of cost to that and a lot of impacts that are very real but it's going to create a lot of jobs and i i think people are seeing that that value as well um, not only are we building things and making stronger infrastructure, but we're also, you know, saving these runs of salmon from extinction at the same time. Yeah, some of the data would show that um, as fish are coming into the John Day, their survival is around 3% and you need at least 2% for replacement. So a male and a female to reproduce and then um, to reproduce themselves. Uh, 
up in the Salmon River Basin, past the four lower snake dams, um, we're less than 1%. And I could tell you what the numbers are, but there's, they're, they are way less than 1%, like 0 0.087, I believe. That's at the hatcheries. We're not even talking about what wild fish are going through. Um, so they're not even making replacement. They are trending towards extinction. It's happening in front of us. And if we don't do something now, it's just gonna, they're gonna blink out in front of us and it's gonna happen in our lifetime. So the, the idea that there's some success there uh, can be shown at the what's going on below the four lower snake dams. There is higher survivability there. The opportunities for success for them to replace themselves and actually get towards trending towards delisting is a reality of if you re remove the four lower snake dams. Thank you all. Uh, another question that we're getting is, what do you see as the biggest obstacle to dam removal and how can community members engage to address this? And of course, this could be different from different perspectives, so feel free to jump in. You could name any of the big obstacles. It doesn't have to be the biggest obstacle. <laughs> um, you know, what's not an obstacle is the science, and that's refreshing uh, because we used to debate the science, but the science is so strong now. Uh, the politics, you know, what's not, the, what's not an obstacle is the litigation. We, we win the litigation. Uh, it's the politics. It, um, and, and I, you know, I would have, I used to say, think it was cultural. Uh, that these, you know, there was just a, a culture that we had developed around the dams that couldn't imagine another way. But I, I, I'm reconsidering that. I've spent some time out in um, Lewiston and Clarkston in a grain elevator talking to farmers. And there was an openness, you know, if the economics lined up, there was an openness to, to putting their product on rail. They were scared about um, the cost, sure, of taking away barging on the Snake River. But what I didn't see was, you know, I'm three generations of bargers and we have to barge. Now I can't, I haven't spoken to barge operators and there may be places where this is really difficult for folks to reimagine. Um, but, uh, you know, the, 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 this is coming down to um, people being sort of stuck in a fear-based mindset around the economics uh, and big change and, um, and we need to, you know, be braver than that, uh, and really, uh, you know, harness some of that same spirit um, that that uh, you know, ironically, that built the dams, and believe that we can uh, really have, um, uh, you know, a better relationship with our ecosystem, and that we can find solutions uh, to get, you know, appreciate the need to get, you know, you need to get your wheat to market. I understand that problem, and I want to help you. Um, so perhaps others have thoughts, but uh, I don't think it's the science or the litigation. Julia, you're spot on. Um, I think that's been one of my main frustrations um, and uh, something that I think, you know, we had this really important opportunity as we've stated before um, with the the way that our delegation is set up with levers of powers in Congress right now, the proposal that's before us, the upcoming infrastructure bill, there's a lot of opportunity for folks to really push on this to, to say it's time to restore the Lower Snake River and, and we can do it in a way that benefits everyone. Um, there's been a lot of different groups weighing in on this. Tribal governments have been at the forefront of this issue for decades environmental groups. Um, there's uh, a lot of movement recently. Uh, we got a letter of support from the Washington Black Lives Matter Alliance saying that they stand in solidarity with tribes in support of removing the four lower Snake River dams. So we just need more and more voices like that coming to the table and saying, now's the time, we have the solutions, we just are lacking the leadership. Shockingly, no one wants to take on what's wrong with politics, the way politics are structured. <laughs> that, you know, political reform for another day. 
uh, maybe not so much political reform, but I would definitely bring up the issue around, um, as I brought up earlier, decolonialism. And you'll see a lot of these narratives, these one sentence fear-based tactics and what gets centered in that is, and they're already happening, uh, what gets centered in that is whiteness. And that is not an anti-white statement. There is a condition that is harmful to all of us. And they will say, I've already heard these things that the, the native people are, are gonna take all the fish from us. And in that statement, what gets what is being said is that we need to group together against them and do not remove those four layer snake dams. And so this narrow narrative gets perpetuated. And it is politics, but it's also very cultural. And it's a culture that has been uh, looking to another planet to find another home. And that to me is a condition that says, that's why I'm asking to take care of this home. I'm not asking anybody to, to leave or go away or leave us alone. I'm just saying, be better neighbors. Treat it like a home, like you would if it was your home. If you say that, then do it. Can I show you? Can I show you all a piece of art that uh, that I think is my. Hold on one sec. This was not uh, this is not planned or staged, but my dear friend Emily Washington gave this to me three or four years, a couple years ago. But um, her partner John Schellenberger has a company called Native Anthro, and he's an artist. But I love this. I don't know if you can see it, decommissioned, decolonized, the big whack kind of cartoon style yeah. in the day. <laughs> I just... Thank you all for sharing. I, you know, along what you were, with what you were just saying, Sammy, there was a question that came in, and I think this is kind of tied into to this is um, this person says that, that your declaration about it not just being about fish but being about people who are so connected to the fish it's something that a lot of folks can't they don't really relate to from their background and this person is asking how can we are there ways that we can bring this closer to our own experience in in the sense that that will add value to our understanding of what we're fighting for and our understanding of of you know the level of respect that we should be having yeah um uh i would say that labor is on non-native people and there is literature out there we've we've gone the steps of speaking in english writing in english and com communicating our ideas in, 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 in english so the work's already done you have the ability to google stuff the labor is on you if you want to have that experience start working on it do it it is we lit so as native people we live in a verb thought world you live in a noun thought world there is a vast difference between those two thought worlds that um, in order for you to start to understand how different that is you have to understand your own culture first and where it ends and where the next one begins as I said earlier, cultural competency, and then being able to interpret when you've when you've left your culture, because when you leave your culture and you start to see the land and you decolonize, you will see something entirely different. But that takes a lot of work. Some people get it. There are people who give up their future of their life to guide on the Middle Fork, where we do a lot of our work. They're guides, and they will only work. That's their only work they get out of the year for the most part. Some of them will go be go work on the mountains on the ski mountains but that's what they live for and so if that kind of connection i see it i see it, it happens and and even if it's a smaller uh proportion of what we experience as native people there are people that are non-native that are that are living it they're trying they really put their souls into it and so it's a lot of work it's not easy being native it's not being easy being an indigenous person it's not easy being an indigenous person in a colonized world and so the labor is on you. It's your work. That's your labor. You got to do it.
I appreciate that reminder. Uh, and I will just offer up a sweet film that I saw the other day um, called My Octopus Teacher. It's trending on Netflix. Uh, and uh, what I loved about it was um, the main character is this guy who just dives every single day and befriends an octopus. But he talks about the distinction between being an insider in the natural world and being a visitor. Um, and uh, sort of the feeling at really um, at home and connected to a place uh, just by getting to know it and by paying attention. And, and to me, um, there was something really, uh, you know, just um, there, was a there was a lesson there. Uh, and I also have spent way too much money at Wacoma Books. Um, <laughs> but there are lots of books out there as well. Uh, and I, you know, find, um, find your inroad in uh, into um, a different way of being, uh, and I, you know, it, it's I, I don't claim to have arrived after one Netflix film and um, a large bill at the bookstore, but I just I think that there are uh, pathways, and this is a question we hear a lot. Um, you know, there are so many just beautifully big-hearted environmentalists uh, like myself, bleeding liberals who want to do better and be better, uh, and we can. Um, and it's it is it is work and a process, and uh, you know you're going to make mistakes. Goodness knows I've made mistakes, um, uh, but you, we can't. As sort of Kate was talking about, you can't let that fear um, uh, come up inside you. You know, you just have have to keep going. I mean, I. Um, my children, they want to know about the native people that lived on this land. They are fascinated by the fact that we're not the first people to have arrived. Uh, and they're three and six, you know, and you can instill this thing in your kids very early, this knowledge and awareness. Uh, and my six-year-old knows when we go into the Mosier Market, which says, uh, established in 1859, uh, that that's not the truth. And she's six. So, you know, um, there is a path out of uh, out of this uh, dream world we've sort of been living in um, that is more uh, culturally aware and um, can make space for a different cultures living side by side, which is what we have. Thank you for that. I would support that. Try make mistakes. Uh, we'll give you a nickname based on that mistake. So I'm being a little serious tonight. I'm really kind of caught up in this, uh, you know, secondary response. I'm, I'm upset. We're, we're talking about an extinction of sound. Uh, but really, um, really, we're lighthearted people. We care a lot. Um, we're kind and nice. I mean, there's a reason we're oppressed. Uh, but in that, it's, but in that um, try, make mistakes. Uh, you will get a name. You will earn that name. And you'll be named because of your mistakes. And until you start to maybe show a different side of yourself, who knows? Um, but yeah, we, we kind of, that's one of the things that happens. We tend to have those non-natives around us that get nicknames and because they made some mistakes. And that's fine. It's okay. Thank you. Yes, mistakes are so valuable to our learning experiences. And I don't know why they've gotten such a bad reputation, but... Yeah. Will I be Julia with the octopus film? Or? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're getting giddy here. It must be close to the end of the program. <laughs> yeah, we do have yeah. just a few more minutes. Um, there was a question that came in, uh, aside from signing the petition, what else can folks do to um, support the removal of the Snake River Dam? So I did put some links in the chat with all of the, the information about the different organizations represented tonight, as well as um, the petition for our um, removal, the Columbia River Keeper petition for the removal of the dams. Um, in addition to that, definitely want folks to reach out to their senators. Um, always, um, you know, writing letters is really important. And there's a couple of um, town halls coming up for Senator Wyden. Soon there's one this Saturday. April 3rd at 12.30, these are all online. Um, and that one's in Hood River County. So if there's any folks from Hood River County um, that wanna join in and speak up on behalf of the salmon, that would be great. Um, you can check the link for that schedule as well in the chat. Um, in terms of 
beyond signing the petition and reaching out to your senators, LTEs are a really great way to kind of get the word out. I think this is a, a, a movement that has growing attention and people are becoming more aware of it. So um, writing LTEs sometimes sounds a little bit intimidating, but don't be intimidated. It's really easy to write an LTE. They're just um, pretty simple. They're just about 200 words. Usually each publication has a little bit different word limit. Um, but you just can write a short little paragraph or two, uh, and you, it doesn't even have to be the maximum amount of words. You can send it in to, the, to multiple publications in your region, um, and it's a really great way to just let folks get a kind of a, a finger on the pulse for how the public is feeling about these issues. So there are a, little, a lot of different ways to get engaged. I encourage you to go to all of the different um, websites for the uh, presenters tonight and learn more about the work that they're doing as well. So you now I'll invite other panelists to, to jump in and say, what else can folks do to get engaged and what would be helpful? You know, Kate, one other thought that I would have or recommend folks to do is uh, make some phone calls into offices as well. Um, that's something that I think is a lot easier to do than most folks think, especially if you call after hours. All that you're doing is leaving a message on your member of Congress's voicemail. Um, I normally pour myself a glass of wine when I do that, so it's a quick and easy <laughs> uh, thing to do. Uh, the other thing is that a lot of our members of Congress, just like many of us, are obsessed with social media. So if you're posting about uh, any of the news that is happening or if you just feel like sharing your opinion, make sure that you tag your elected officials so that they know that their constituents are talking about it and want, their, and want them to do something about it. <clears throat> yeah, that's great, Rob. And I, I would just add that, you know, none of this is is new or visionary or rocket science you know these are just that we just need to convince our elected officials to do something visionary here and there's a lot of uh, of inertia of the the status quo right of leaving these dams in it's how it's been you know it's gonna take a lot of work to change this and we don't have huge squadrons of lobbyists and you know, powerful interests. I mean, we have us, you know, we have the people on this call and many others that believe like us and, and, um, and we just need to mobilize and be louder. And um, yeah, we do the chi activist things and the things that are better pick, you know, visuals, but a lot of it comes down to, you know, thousands of people making phone calls, signing petitions, writing letters, all of those things that are boring and mundane and we think don't make a difference but i can tell you when i when we talk to you know senator wyden staff or talk to senator cantwell staff like they tell you who they've heard from and it, it does make a difference so I, I wish there was a uh, a magic wand that made this easier but it's the same old thing that has always created change in our democracy Yeah, I would second that. I think a lot of the things that have been changing in our society has definitely been a grassroots from a lot of different uh, communities, a lot of different uh, backgrounds. Um, I think if uh, we're not heard, I think what's being understood by politicians is that um, you should be preparing for a protest. And I think that that is something that probably sits in the back of their minds now that enough people in this country could get around something that if they don't get heard, they will get out in the streets. And I think that's been a really good change in our, in our society. That's been something that's really happening. I would say before that though, just do all the things that were just mentioned, just get out, canvas. We gotta do the things to make it work for us first. And um, if we end up in some of those narratives where it's us against them, this is not a competition. We need cooperation. And I hope that if anything I share tonight, we are here in cooperation. Um, I am here in cooperation, and that is really a verb thinking world for me. Uh, for us as Native people, we really think about cooperation as a priority. So when I talk about relationships, um, and this isn't a competition, I would really like to see us all take better care of our home and our homeland. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sammy. And I think that that's a really, really important 
point and I think that us continuing these conversations from here is something that is really important as well and not just doing the webinar and kind of going okay good you know we've got everybody rubbed up so I think yes it's important I hope that everyone on tonight will take some sort of action and feels inspired to do that and will share this information with their networks but this is an ongoing conversation and we are introducing ourselves to each other some of us still but this is something that we need to continue i see i saw in the chat barbara bernstein from kboots here and is very interested in, in continuing this conversation on locus focus so um i think this is something that we will continue to pursue and i really appreciate all of you being here tonight to all the panelists thank you so much for for taking your time and and energy to be with us here i know there's a lot of demands and zoom time and everything and it's it's you've added all of you have added so much value to this conversation um and uh, just have a lot of gratitude for you sharing your knowledge with us and um yeah so thank you so much for being here tonight and with that i'm gonna call it because we are right at 7 31 so um i think we covered a lot in a short amount of time so thank you all so much and i hope um thank you to everyone who attended i'm sorry to those of you whose questions we didn't get answered I will try to follow up um, after the chat, but um, thank you so much and we will all be in touch soon, hopefully.